Well, now that we've introduced metabolism and energy, we're now able to really jump into human metabolism. And we get to talk about those high energy molecules. Those three big ones that we, we keep bringing up, the main one, of course, being ATP, um, right here at the top, right? Adenosine triphosphate, the main energy molecule. And we want to remember that energy is stored in covalent bonds, whether it be an ATP, NADH, or NADPH, <clears throat> those coenzymes that we mentioned before. When bonds are broken and energy um, molecules oxidized, energy is released. So the whole idea is, is that within the bonds with, of these high energy molecules, there are lots of energy. When you break those bonds, the molecules break apart and energy is released either as heat or due to or to do mechanical work or for biosynthesis so we have where do we get our fuel once again it's our food it's those macronutrients carbohydrates fats and proteins and through catabolism we break it down we eat it uh, oxidative exergonic we break it down to energy poor products water carbon dioxide ammonia right so this is what we bring in at the top and that's what we put out and of course out of that we get chemical energy ATP and NADPH so the energy that was in these big bonds up here in our carbs fats and proteins are transferred to the, these molecules here and then we can use that for anabolism for building right so we'll take the smaller precursor molecules amino acids, sugars, fatty acids, nitrogenous bases, and we'll make our big macromolecules, our proteins, our polysaccharides, lipids, and nucleic acids. So think of it this way. ATP, our main energy molecule, that's like gasoline. That's our gasoline, our main fuel source, right? Like gasoline for a car. But we don't take crude oil out of the ground and stick it into our gas tank. We have to refine it first. So kind of the same idea is we're going to take our crude oil, our food, right? And we're going to break those bonds down and we're going to transfer the energy in those bonds to ATP and NADPH, NADH, what have you, and, the, and to a form of energy that we can use, a, a molecule that we can use, and then we can use that for building things to make those bigger molecules and so forth. So ATP, what is it? I keep seeing it over and over again. You guys already know it's not motor oil. Um, it's the primary energy currency for all your cells. It's the only one for your muscle cells. There's approximately 7 kcals per mole of ATP. And there it is. It is a nucleoside triphosphate. So once again, it falls under the category of nucleic acids. We have our nitrogenous base, adenine right here. Our nitrogenous base. We have our sugar, and instead of just one phosphate, we've got three phosphates. So this is a nucleoside triphosphate, they call it. And in fact, if we only had one phosphate here, this would be the same type of thing as the, what we would see in RNA, whenever we say adenine and RNA, representing the, uh, from the nitrogenous base, this pyrimidine here. It's just like our, uh, from RNA, except it has two additional phosphates. But what I really want you to notice, look at these negative charges. Here, 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 here. These negative charges really repel each other. They don't like being near each other. I mentioned this once before, which means these bonds in here and in here must be very strong high energy bonds. And in order to get these high energy, these these negative charges all close to each other and linked together, this got to be a lot of energy holding these bonds. All right, so think of it like a compressed spring. Once again, so we have a spring that would much rather be extended like this, and we're going to put a force on this end and a force on this end, and we're going to compress it together and make it look more like this. So there's lots of potential energy. Right? So lots and lots of energy in this ATP. Now I showed you this kind of a scary looking uh, real or 
uh, <clears throat> you know, representation of where all the carbons are at and all the oxygens and the nitrogens and the phosphate. No, you don't need to know that detail. I want you just to appreciate ATP and the high energy that's stored within those phosphates, especially between the second and third phosphates. For our purposes right now, this is good enough. Adenosine represented by the big A and three low phosphates, PPP, right there. And just realize whenever our cells need energy to do anything, and in this case I'm going to refer mostly to muscular work as an example, whenever we need to perform muscular work, we're going to break apart that bond between that second and third phosphate right there. And what we're going to end up with is adenosine diphosphate, ADP, poor little inorganic phosphate all by itself and lots and lots of energy. Now, why do we have to go through this complicated taking energy from carbohydrates and fats and to a lesser extent proteins and transferring it to ATP only to break down the ATP to be to sometimes use to make carbohydrates? It sounds a little backward sometimes. Well, why don't we just store massive amounts of ATP? Why don't we just take in ATP? Well, ATP, well, it's such a high energy molecule that we can't store a whole lot of it. It's, it's a little bit unstable. So we only have enough in our muscles for about two to four seconds. That's it. Two to four seconds of muscle activation. Boom, your ATP is done. Then what? Well, that means as soon as we start using our ATP, because we don't store that much of it in our muscles, we have to immediately start replenishing it. Right? We have to replenish it, because remember, we ended up with this reaction of ATP going to ADP and energy and inorganic phosphate. I'm going to represent like this. That's where it's going, right? Well, really what we're talking about now is, yes, ATP, in order to do work, in order to, in this case, for in our example, fuel muscle contraction needs to go like this. However, we need to immediately replenish again. So when I say the words energy systems, it's the systems that the body uses, the cells use, to replenish ATP, which basically means we're turning these arrows around, bringing ATP, ADP, inorganic phosphate, and energy this way to make new ATP. It's the reverse reaction. ADP plus inorganic phosphate plus energy to yield ATP. So how do we do it? Well, there are two categories and three pathways. All right, how do we replenish ATP? The two broad categories are anaerobic, of which there is um, the ATP PC system, which is phosphocreatine, and glycolysis. Anaerobic meaning without oxygen, technically the Latin meaning without air. And aerobic meaning with oxygen, with air, which is oxidative phosphorylation or cellular respiration. All right, so when I talk about energy systems, this right here is what I'm talking about. I'm going to, once again, go a little more detailed than your book goes, and um, uh, as well as uh, I want you to, to realize that when you get into exercise physiology, even more, so this becomes even more important that you understand these three primary energy systems. So in this lecture, I just want to introduce the first one, the ATP PC system, phosphocreatine. You will also hear the term creatine phosphate. Once again, thank you, science, for calling the same thing two different names, phosphocreatine, creatine phosphate, same thing. So we can see on our little picture over here, we've got creatine phosphate, and we have that ADP. So basically, we started using um, our ATP in our muscle, and we started to accumulate this adenosine diphosphate, right? Well, in our muscles, this is just muscles here, creatine acts like a little phosphate reservoir, and it's just waiting to pass off its phosphate to ADP to create ATP and creatine all by itself. Guess what? What's going to drive this? An enzyme. And it's creatine kinase. Oh, wait a minute. Kinase. Wait a minute. Kinase has to do with phosphorylation, which is exactly what we're doing. Remember I said kinase always think phosphate? Well, look at it. 
creatine kinase, we're taking a phosphate from here and putting it over here. So let's look at this. It is anaerobic. Have I said anything about oxygen? Nope, because there isn't any. We don't need oxygen at this point. Its fuel source is phosphocreatine, creatine phosphate. It's a primary fuel source when the duration is under 10 seconds, intensity is high, um, it's enzyme controlled like I mentioned, it's end products are ATP and creatine. Now I do want to stop here for just a second because I'm going to teach you these different, uh, these three different energy systems. And it's going to sound like, well, one does its job and then the next one takes over and then that one does its job and can't do it anymore and the next one takes over. And that's not entirely true. Really all of them are working at all times is just which is the dominant energy system at any particular time at any particular intensity. And this will be the dominant one under any t high intensity muscle activation where you, it's a short duration, high intensity. This is going to be your primary energy system. What happens to creatine? Well, we just used it up, so how are we going to rephosphorylate it? Well, what happens when it's no longer PC, once again, no longer phosphocreatine, just creatine, it's all used up. At rest, that same enzyme reloads, rephosphorylates the creatine to phosphocreatine for the next exercise bout. Now think about it, remember, enzymes work both directions. It's a reverse process, instead of releasing energy, energy is needed. Well, wait a minute, where are we going to get that energy? From ATP, of course. But that's gained during rest. That's gained aerobically during rest and recovery. So once again, creatine kinase can make it go either way. So think of it this way. If I have lots of ATP in the cell because I'm at rest, creatine kinase is going to fill up all my creatine to make phosphocreatine. If I don't have a lot of ATP and I have a lot of ADP, Phosphocreatine square passes phosphate over here and make ATP.